title of my sermon today is How Much You Matter to God. And, and I want to talk with you today about that. You know, one of the deepest needs that all of us have, quite frankly, is the need to feel secure. And however, we are all pretty insecure in some area of our lives. And as a result of that insecurity, quite frankly, we are constantly doing two things. See if, see if this sounds familiar. These two things are we are evaluating and we are comparing. We all do it and we do it pretty much all of the time. We may do it consciously, we may do it unconsciously, but the truth is, is we do it all the time. There are four things that the world will tell you that you are going to need to do or need to look at if you want to be valuable in this world today. Those four things are the first one is appearance. How do I look? We all think about that. We all look in the mirror every day and we ask that same question. How do I look? You know, we think, I think in our minds, we think this. We think that if we look good, then we must be good. And if we, and if we look good, then we must be valuable. But if we only have high value based upon the way we look, then quite frankly, most of us are left out. I mean, we're not, it's just the truth of the matter. We really do, are left out. You know, one time my grandson, Ezra, he was sitting on my lap, and, and he was very softly, very easily touching my cheek, and, and he would touch my cheek, and then he would touch his cheek. And, and I could tell that he had something on his mind. I couldn't tell what it was, but finally he said, Granddaddy, did God make you? And I said, well, yeah, Ezra, God made me a long, long time ago. He thought about that for a moment, and he asked another question. Granddaddy, did, did God make me? And I said, well, yeah, Ezra, God made you too. He made you just a few years ago. And he touched my cheek, and he touched his cheek again, and he finally said, you know, God's getting better at this, isn't he, Granddaddy? <laughs> The second false way to evaluate your worth is by affluence. Affluence just means how much do we own. You know, this is the myth of materialism, and it is a myth. The myth of materialism goes like this. It says, if I own a lot of stuff, then that makes me important, and that makes me valuable, and that makes me worth a lot. That's what we think when we think of materialism. The third thing that we judge ourselves on is our, as far as worth goes is our achievement. Our achievement basically goes like this. If I get a lot of things done, then that makes me valuable. If I get a lot of, a lot of work done, then that makes me feel good about myself. And, and if, I get a, if I get a trophy, if I get a promotion, if I get some of these things that the world says are of value, then that must make me good. Make me good. The fourth is approval. Basing our approval, worth on our approval, basically goes like this. How well am I liked? How well am I liked? If I am liked a lot, then I guess that means I'm worth a lot. And if I'm not, you know, if I'm liked a little bit, that means, I guess that means that I'm worth a little bit. And if I'm not liked at all, then that means that I'm just not worth anything. And that's just simply not true. I know the world tells you all of those things all of the time, but it's simply not true. Now here is the problem with these four things. Appearance, affluence, achievement, and approval. The problem with them is that they are all unstable and unreliable sources of security. Let's just, let's just go down the list. Let's just go down the list and look at it. Appearance, for instance. My grandson is right. He absolutely was right. Our beauty fades. Listen, if you think that you don't look so good right now, uh, well, let me just say this. If you think that you don't look so good right now, wait 10 years. <laughs> wait 10 years. Affluence. Possessions wear out. I don't care what it's made out of. It might be made out of concrete, plastic, wood. It might be made out of metal. I don't care what it's made out of. It will not last. It just is not going to last. Achievements. Our successes are surpassed. I don't care what you accomplish in life. Somebody's going to do better than you did. Somebody's going to do better than I did. The only solid foundation for our self-esteem Say this again, the only solid foundation for our self-esteem is understanding just how much you matter to God. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. I think that a great example of that, I, I believe, in my own mind, is the life of Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus, as you know, the story about Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. That's what you know about Zacchaeus, right? So you don't know a whole lot about Zacchaeus other than that he was a wee little man, right? Well, I'm going to tell you more about Zacchaeus today and, and see if you can understand who he really was in the Bible. Not who you think he is, but who he really was. In Luke, 
the 19th chapter, 1 through 4, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So we have Zacchaeus, and you know, the truth of the matter is, is this is a story about the four ways that we judge ourselves, and Zacchaeus struck out three times out of four. He really did. Yes, it says in the Bible that he was a very wealthy man, but the reason why he was so wealthy was, listen, he was not this cute little man that you're thinking about. Actually, he was a very corrupt man. He was a very dishonest man. That's how he became wealthy. That's who he really was. He was wealthy because of his corruption, but he struck out on the other ways three different times, in three different ways. So first of all, Zacchaeus does not like his appearance. The Bible says that Zacchaeus was a very short man. In fact, he was so short that he couldn't see above the crowd. Tradition, tradition tells us that Zacchaeus was actually the shortest man in Jericho. Actually, he probably was about like a midget or dwarf stage. He wasn't very big at all. He was a very small man. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, it's true. And it's because of that that he's probably been teased, quite frankly, think about this. He's probably been teased his entire life. My guess is, is they didn't even call him by his name. They probably called him Shorty or you know, Stump or something other than that. And you know, I, I don't have to tell you, children can be pretty mean. They can be pretty darn mean, as mean as adults and maybe worse. And I'm sure that they didn't even call him by his name. Second thing is, is nobody liked him. We think of this little, with this cute little wee man, nobody liked Zacchaeus. His appeal rating was zero. I mean, Donald Trump's is like 40, 45 percent, something like that. You know, he's got a pretty high rating compared to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was zero. It says in the Bible here that he was the chief tax collector, which means nobody liked him. There is no way anybody liked him. Truth is, is even today, tax collectors, we don't care all that much for them. But back in these days, quite frankly, the Roman tax system was very corrupt. Very, very corrupt. First of all, in order to even become a tax collector, you had to bribe an official. That's the only way you're going to get this job because everybody knew that you were going to make a lot of money. So everybody wanted this job for the wealth. And so they bribed the officials, so he got it. If he got a job, and certainly he, got the, he was the chief tax collector, he got the job because he was dishonest and corrupt. Then in the Roman tax collection, uh, collection system, you could collect more than the tax was. You could collect two, three, four, five times more than the Romans wanted for their taxes, and you got to keep everything other than what you owed the tax. So if you collected twice as much, three times as much, you got to keep all the extra. Rome just wanted their share. So that's one of the reasons, another reason why they did not like him. Then you add on top of that the fact that Zacchaeus was a Jew, and now he has jumped ship, and it's more or less like treason. No self-respecting Jew would ever become a Roman tax collector. Zacchaeus is the most hated man in the city of Jericho. No, he's not this cute little man that we have painted this picture of. He is the most hated man in the city of Jericho. He has an appearance problem. He has a, an approval problem. You could, take, you could not pick a more hated person in all of Jericho for Jesus to stop and talk to. That's who Zacchaeus really was. Not only that, Zacchaeus doesn't even like himself. The reason why he doesn't like himself is because of all of his achievements, he knows that he got these dishonestly. He knows that he got these corruptly. He had all of, yes, he has all of this money, but he knows that he basically stole this money from the people that he collected taxes from. However, in one snap of the finger, just like that, his life is transformed. How did that happen? Here's how it happened. Jesus shows up. The same way it happened in your life, the same way it happened in mine. Jesus shows up. Jesus, the Bible says that he was walking down the streets of Jericho and, and all of the people uh, in Jericho are kind of, it's kind of, it reminds me of a parade atmosphere, honestly. You know how everybody tries to get there early enough to where they can see and get a good position and see? Well, Jesus is walking down through the city of Jericho and all of these people are there and he decides that he's going to stop and talk to, of all the people, 
He's going to stop and talk to the one who is the most disrespected, the most, uh, dis, uh, most uh, corrupt, the most evil person in the entire city of Jericho, Zacchaeus. That's who he decides he's going to talk to that day. He comes to the tree that Zacchaeus is in. He stops and he looks up and he says in verse 5, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to Zacchaeus, Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. The story teaches us four, four truths about how much you matter to God. First one is this. No matter how small I feel, Jesus notices me. No matter how small I feel, he notices me. You know, when Jack, Jack, uh, Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is coming to town, he does two things that no wealthy Jewish man would ever do. Two different things. The first thing he does is he runs. People, if you were a Jew back in those days, you didn't run anywhere. And especially if you were a wealthy Jew, you didn't run anywhere. Slaves ran for you, quite frankly. Servants ran for you. You didn't run anywhere. But Zacchaeus doesn't care. I think Jack Zacchaeus, quite frankly, is kind of at the end of his rope. He's tired of being hated. He's tired of being mis mistreated. He's tired of being who he was, and he has something on his mind. Like I said, he's looking for the best seat that he can find in this situation, so he runs ahead of the crowd. Number two, he climbs a tree. No Jewish man is going to climb a tree. No businessman, no Jewish businessman is going to climb a tree. Zacchaeus, he is just hoping to get a glimpse of Jesus. I think, like I said, I think he's in a desperate situation for whatever reason it might be, and he's just hoping to get a place where he can see Jesus at least. But Jesus does something even more shocking, far more shocking, quite frankly. He stops at the tree where Zacchaeus is, is in, and, and, and it, there's this, group, this huge crowd there along with them and all of the people in the crowd that day. He pays, he pays attention to Zacchaeus of all people. Can you imagine how Zacchaeus' heart began to, to be racing? I mean, out of all of the people there that day, Jesus stops at my tree, looks up at me, and calls me by name, me, of all people, Zacchaeus is thinking. I am short, I am, over, I am overlooked, I am insignificant, and yet Jesus, of all people, is paying attention to me. Do you ever wonder why Jesus stopped at that particular tree and looks up? I read the Bible a lot of times and I ask myself these questions, quite frankly. Why was it that Jesus stops right there at that tree and looks up? Well, here's the answer to that question. Because he knows where Zacchaeus is going to be. That's the reason why he stopped there. Listen, I don't know what you're going through. I may know, I may not know. You may feel as if you're up a tree financially. You may feel as if you're up a tree, you know, for emotional, relational, whatever it might be. Or you may believe that you're in a hole spiritually and that nobody even knows that you're there. But God does. God absolutely does. He knows and he notices you as well. In fact, he's always had his eye on you. And that is the truth. He has always had his eye on you, and the reason why is because you matter to him. You absolutely matter to him. Listen, there has never been a moment of your life ever, not a moment of your life ever, when God has ever taken his eye off you. He always knows where you're at. You may feel that what you're going through, that, that God is a million miles away, and I think we've all felt that. That God is a million miles away. Well, the truth of the matter is, when we think that, we're wrong. We're just wrong. Before Zacchaeus ever climbed that tree, God knew exactly where he was going to be, and God knows exactly where we are at this very moment, wherever that may be. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, wherever that may be, God knows exactly where we're at. And he has seen everything that has happened to you. He's seen everything that has happened to me. All of the, the bad and all of the unkind things that have happened to us, he's seen it all, and quite frankly, he grieved with us when it happened. He absolutely did. No hurt has ever been hidden from God. Number two, no matter who ignores me, Jesus knows me. You know, Jesus doesn't just notice you as one in seven billion people. He doesn't just know you as a little dot down here on earth as seven, one of seven billion people. He doesn't just notice you, he knows you. He knows you, and he calls Zacchaeus by name. 
You know, all of his life, I would imagine, Zacchaeus has been ridiculed and rejected. First, because he was such a short man, he was like this short as a man, and then because of his occupation. The second part of this verse says, And Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said. Can you imagine the shock of Zacchaeus that day? He knows my name. I mean, Jesus Christ, he, he, he knows my name. I want to tell you this. God not only knows where you are, he knows you by name. He absolutely knows you by name. He not only knows what you're going through right now, in fact, he knows why you're going through it, and he cares. You know, Jesus is walking through the city of Jericho, and a crowd is following him, and he stops at this tree. He knew what was in the tree. He looks up, and he sees the most hated person in the city, Zacchaeus, and he calls him by name. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. Now, this shocks everybody there. First reason it shocks them is because that, that he knows Zacchaeus' name, but the second reason is this. It's the meaning of his name. You see, names back in the Old Testament especially meant something, and Zacchaeus' name meant something. Do you know what it means? Here's what it means. Pure one. Well, that was anything but what Zacchaeus was at that point in time. Pure one. Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus in that tree and he says, hey, pure one, I'll bet that it had been years, think about this, I'll bet that it had been years since anybody had ever called Zacchaeus by his real name. I'm sure they had names like Stubby and Shorty and Half Pint and all of those things. I guarantee you they didn't really even know the man's name. I'm sure they called him everything but his real name. But Jesus calls him by his name, his real name. Why? Because Jesus was affirming his potential rather than pointing out his past. That's why. You know, Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and he doesn't, and he doesn't point out his flaws. He says, hey, pure one. You know, why so many people are afraid to come close to Jesus, or at least I think, why so many people are afraid to come close to Jesus, I think it's because they think that if they get close to Jesus, you know what Jesus is going to do if I get close to him? He's going to point out all of the flaws, all of the things that I have ever done wrong. That's what he's going to do, and that's just not the truth. It's just not the truth. You don't see him doing that in the Bible. You really don't. You don't see it doing, doing that to Zacchaeus. You don't see it doing that to the, to the adultery. You don't see it any time other than maybe the re religious leaders. Jesus goes to the biggest sinner in town, and he doesn't say, Zacchaeus, here are all of the things that you have ever done wrong. He doesn't do that at all. He says, hey, pure one. What's he doing? He is treating Zacchaeus the way that Zacchaeus wants to be treated. He is treating him the way that he should be treated. He says to Zacchaeus, I know, I know you, I made you, and I know your potential, and I am not looking at your sin. I am looking at what I made you to be, and I made you to be a pure one. Listen, no matter how insignificant I may feel, Jesus notices me. And no matter how many things that go wrong in my life, quite frankly, and how many people ignore me, Jesus knows me, and he knows me by name. I love Isaiah 49, 16. Listen to this verse. Isaiah 49, 16 says this. See, I have written your name on my hand. Every time that God looks at his hand, guess who he's thinking about? He's thinking about you. Three, no matter what I have done, Jesus wants me. Zacchaeus' appearance made him feel insecure. His, his accusers made him feel resentful. But Zacchaeus' sins made him feel guilty and ashamed. I think that's why he was in that tree that day. So Jesus does the most shocking thing of all. He invites himself to Zacchaeus' home. That's what he's doing. Verse 5 again, it says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, now Jesus knows us so well, and he knows Zacchaeus so well back in those days that he knew that Zacchaeus, because of the guilt that he felt about his job, about his occupation, that he would never, ever invite Jesus to his house. So Jesus takes the initiative and invites himself how long do you think it took Zacchaeus to get out of that tree? 
I guarantee you one thing. I bet it didn't take very long. I would bet that I don't care. You know, he'd probably say this. I don't care if I get splinters in my butt. I'm coming down out of this tree because Jesus is going to meet with me to my house for dinner. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, no matter what you have done, I want to come to your house. I want to be in a relationship with you. And you know, he said the same thing to you and to me some time ago. And he says the same thing to you and me every day, quite frankly. I want to be in a relationship with you. That's how much you matter to God. That's how much I matter to God. Number four, no matter what others may say about me, Jesus affirms me. You know, they may call me this and they may call me that, but all that really matters is what God calls me. And all that really matters is that he affirms me. You know, when Jesus pays attention to the biggest sinner in town and he says, I'm going to your house, what do you think the other's reactions would be? He heard, they all heard it right there. They saw him that day. What do you think it would be? Verse 7, here's what it said, just about exactly what you would think. Verse 7 says, all the people saw this and they began to mutter. They're talking about him. That's what they're doing. They're talking about Jesus. How in the world, here's what they say, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner? Verse 9, verse 9, it goes on to say, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. What he's doing there is he is defending and he is protecting Zacchaeus. Verse 6 says that Zacchaeus came down at once and he received Jesus with joy. You know, with a God who loves us like this, like this, can you name one logical reason why we would not want to receive Jesus with joy? Listen, I don't know what you're going through. You may feel as if you're out on a limb. You may feel you're up a tree. I don't know. But here's what I do know. I invite you to, wherever you might be, to jump down into the loving arms of your Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, your Savior. Because no matter how small or how insignificant you may feel, Jesus notices you. And no matter who ignores you, he knows you and I by name. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word today. Thank you for its truth. I thank you, Lord, that you know us all by name. In fact, you have our name written on the palm of your hand. That's how much we matter to you. Lord, don't help us not to be thinking about what the world says and what the world thinks and what the world this and what the world that. What's important is what do you say? Who are you? Who are we to you? We matter to you. That's what we need to be reminded of every day. In your precious name we pray. Amen. For hymn number 365.